The second announcement I have uh, is from Gary Everly. He is planning a church work day. Uh, that's going to be Saturday, April 27th from 8 to 12 in the morning. Uh, and uh, he had a number of jobs. There's going to be some flower bed work, some power washing, cleaning the windows, stuff like that. Uh, his words to me were, we can find a job for anyone no matter your skill level. I can confirm that personally. When I came to my first uh, Saturday workday years ago here when I started at Toreen, uh, Gary realized my level of skill and had me escape, uh, scraping grout, or not grout, uh, but scraping and cleaning the air conditioner vents out of the wall, which is about my level of skill. He realized that quickly. He read me very well. That is my level of skill. But we can find a job for anyone. Uh, and I'm not going to be able to be here that Saturday the 27th. So this coming Saturday, the 20th, I plan on being over here from 8 to noon myself uh, to do some inside cleaning, do some dusting and vacuuming, stuff like that, uh, here in the sanctuary, over in the kitchen, uh, and start doing some general cleaning. So if uh, you want to join me next Saturday, feel free to. I'll be here regardless from about 8 to 12. I invite you to join me for that. Uh, and then this coming Friday, uh, we are going to be showing the first two episodes of season four of The Chosen here at Corey. That's going to be at 7 p.m. this Friday. If you have not started watching The Chosen yet, uh, you've got five days to binge the first three seasons uh, and get through them. It's, it's been an incredible show. And so uh, Lou is going to be doing that for us here Friday night at 7. I'll be here as well. Uh, we invite you to join us for that. We're looking forward to it. Uh, church, this morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. As we prepare for our call to worship this morning, uh, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and some of the most foundational truths of the gospel that Paul highlights are found in the book of Ephesians. Uh, and some of my favorite is found in the first ten verses of chapter two. He's writing to this church that he loves so much in Ephesus. He's reminding them of where they came from before Jesus. And he says in Ephesians chapter two, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Uh, as we prepare this morning to worship, as we prepare to continue together in Matthew chapter 8, I want to draw our attention to uh, to the first verse here of chapter 2 in the teachings. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. This is true of all of us. All of us, our nature was against God. The nature of the flesh was to go against our Creator. And then in verse 4, we get uh, one of my favorite, you hear him refer to as but statements. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, 
even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ. And fourth, we even dive into Matthew chapter 8 together this morning. That is the truth I want in the forefront of our minds. That while we were dead, it is Christ Jesus that makes us alive again. Would you pray with me this morning? Jesus, this morning, we thank you that you are the Word made flesh. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the truth sound. And Lord, we thank you this morning as Paul points out for us for your mercy. That Lord, you're not just making us good. You're not just making us better. Lord, we were dead and you have made us alive. And would we just relish in the beauty of that truth this morning as we worship a God who is worthy of our worship. Jesus, you are good. You are holy. And we thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign. Uh, Lord, as the world around us shows us constantly, there's just so much upheaval, there's so much hatred, and there's so much division. But Lord, not one single thing that is happening right now in our world is surprising you or catching you off guard. You are sovereign over everything that happens. And Jesus, I pray that we would rest in the truth of your sovereignty this morning. That we would not panic and feel like we have to figure things out and we have to fix things that are not within our control, but Lord, allow us to rest in the sovereignty and allow us to bask in the truth that when we were dead, you made us alive in your mercy and in your grace. By grace we have been saved, not our works. We thank you for that this morning. Be with us right now as we worship. We love you so much, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Oh, man. Church, what an awesome reminder uh, of that. You know, that we can sing the God who's merciful, who's faithful, who leads us and guides us. And that is a joy that we receive. And it's why we sing this morning. It's why we worship. It's why we lift high the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So let's get a joy this morning. Let's all stand together. And as we enter into his presence and sing his holy name. Yeah. 
Perfect in 
word, we're reminded this morning that you are a good, good father. You are perfect in all of your ways. Lord, you're perfect in all of your ways. Lord, lead us and guide us into your holy word, into your truth. Let us receive your goodness, Father. Receive your truth. Let us walk in that every day. Let us walk in it. Live in it. Thank you, Jesus, for this time. Lead us, Lord. Amen. Amen. You take a seat. We'll go ahead and dismiss the kids. Go ahead downstairs to the kids' church as well. Church is really going to be back with you this morning. It's been uh, several weeks, but we are going to be resuming looking at Matthew chapter 8 together this morning. Uh, we've already been about halfway through Matthew chapter 8, kind of taking us back a few weeks before Easter. Uh, so far in chapter 8, uh, we have seen Jesus uh, coming down a lot of preaching and teaching, uh, followed by a, a great crowd. This is the very first verse of chapter 8. He came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. Um, we see a, a leprous man come to Jesus and be healed. We see Jesus make his way back to uh, the place in which he stayed, Capernaum, uh, and a Roman centurion coming to him uh, and asking for his servant whom to be healed. And we see Jesus heal that servant from afar with the word. And when we looked at uh, Matthew chapter 8 the last time together a few weeks back, uh, we saw Jesus healing many people in Capernaum. And what we see there is the distinction that he wasn't just healing physical sickness, but then people with demons uh, begin are, are brought to him, and we see him start to exert this authority over the spiritual realm as well. And that's where we pick up this morning. Matthew chapter 8, looking at verses 18 through 22. We see Jesus uh, continuing here to, to teach, but not in a formal setting like with the Sermon on the Mount, but teach in the moment that people come to him. Uh, verses 18 through 22 says, Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Uh, since he has started teaching here in the book of Matthew over the last several chapters, uh, the crowd following Jesus has been growing steadily. We see a lot of the Gospels kind of speaking to this, especially the book of Mark. Uh, Mark very often points out the great crowd that surrounded Jesus. Even at one point when we have the woman with the issue of blood coming to him as he's making his way to Jairus' house, the crowds are so great around him that when she touches the hem of his garment and Jesus says, who touched me, the disciples almost laugh and say, you see all these people around you and yet you ask who touched me. We get this imagery throughout the Gospels of describing this growing movement that Jesus is often moving through crowds that are crammed together like sardines and the, the disciples and Jesus are kind of having to work their way through the crowd. And this continues throughout his ministry as more and more people uh, are around him and seeing the miracles that he's displaying as more and more people in the surrounding areas are, are hearing the news of these miracles. These were not things that uh, we see Jesus multiple times throughout the Gospels perform great miracles and then say to people, especially early in his ministry, go and tell no one about this. And then we see some of those same people immediately go and start telling everyone about this. When you have been a paralytic or a blind person your entire life and a man comes and gives you sight, something tells me the news about that is going to spread. That's going to travel. And we see that with Jesus. And so we start to see people coming from distances away to hear him teach, to see him. This is not an uncommon thing in human history. Literally six days ago, millions of people converged on a thin line through our country 
because they knew that they would see an eclipse in totality. They knew that they would see something amazing. And so throughout human history, when people hear about amazing things, they're going to go travel to see that thing. People are doing the same for Jesus here early in the book of Matthew. They're traveling far and wide, some maybe to hear him teach, uh, some maybe with the intent, as we see this morning, of following him as a disciple, uh, and most, we can say, coming because they want to see a miracle. They want to see him do something incredible. And so the crowd is growing. There's a momentum around Jesus that is growing here, and we need to pay close attention to how Jesus responds to this. Right away in verse 18, it says that he sees the crowd around him. He sees the growth. He sees this attention starting to turn towards him. It says he gives the disciples orders. He gave orders to go over to the other side. The context here, they're by the Sea of Galilee. And as the crowds around him are growing, he says, we're going to go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Effectively, what he is saying here is there's crowds here. We're going to move away. We're going to go to the other side and get away from these crowds. And this is so counter to what we see other leaders throughout human history do. Typically, when you have a movement that is beginning to gain followers and beginning to gain momentum and it's starting to grow, you would put yourself in the midst of those crowds. You would continue what you've already been doing to grow those crowds. You would try to grow that movement quickly. And in seeing Jesus do the opposite, we're seeing the differences between the kingdom of God that he is proclaiming in his ministry and the, the earthly movements of men here on earth. Many men and women came and followed him because they wanted to see something amazing. They wanted to hear great teaching. They wanted to be associated with something bigger than themselves. That's a big part of what it means to be human. And yet Jesus is wanting to call them to greater things than that. And they don't yet realize it. Look at verses 19 and 20. We see two examples of this here in the following verses. A scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So the scribe approaches him, and this is likely a man who has maybe been a part of this crowd for some time, has maybe heard Jesus teach, maybe even seen Jesus perform miracles. And because of his position as a scribe, he has probably seen some of the, the men that Jesus has been surrounding himself with. And I want us to, to kind of see where we are within Jesus' ministry. Uh, this is likely fairly early on in Jesus' ministry to the point where he doesn't even have all 12 of his disciples around him yet. If you look at chapter 9 and your Bible has headings, you'll see a heading in chapter 9 that literally says Jesus calls Matthew. And so Jesus, when it refers to disciples around him at this point, it's not specifically referring to the 12. Uh, he, of course, throughout his ministry had great crowds following him that would have been called disciples as well. Often I think we get this image in our mind of Jesus uh, making his way with just a small group of people, the 12, following him, and that's it. At the peak of some of his ministry, about two to three years in, there would have been large swaths of people following him, considering themselves disciples. So when we see the crowd and disciples referred to, these are people who have likely been with Jesus for some time. And the scribe probably thinks because of his position, because he is a scribe, uh, he might, if he gets in on this movement early, he might be considered a leader in this group with Jesus. Uh, that he would go with Jesus, and he comes to him with that, and proudly proclaims, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus responds, and I want to be clear here, and you'll see in your Bible, at no point does Jesus say no. He does not say, no, you cannot follow me, but he does respond to the scribe with truth. Foxes have holes, birds in the air have nests, the Son of Man, has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus tells the scribe, listen, I have no home, I have no place of comfort that I can return to. 
I don't have a place to keep things. I have no place to consistently lay my head down in the same bed each night. And Jesus here speaks to the concept of home to describe. And the reality is, home can be many different things to many different people. Home can be a house that one has lived in their whole lives. It can be a house you've moved into recently and have made home. Uh, home can be a hometown. Uh, home can even be uh, the, the one's birth function, where they're originally from. But in our society in which we live in today, and really not just in our society, throughout human history, to be without a place to call home leaves so much in the air. But it also cultivates a much deeper dependence on the Father. Jesus makes it known by saying this, that he has no place, nowhere to lay his head each and every night. Jesus is saying to the scribe, I am dependent on my Father for everything. I am dependent on my Father for provision, for protection, for rest, for everything. And these are some of the realities that Jesus is calling us into when we, like the scribe, come to him that first time and say, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. I will follow you wherever you lead me. He doesn't say no to us, but he gives us the truth of what that will look like. And we live in a world, and particularly for us, church, we live in a country that says that there is a, a way to go about life. That it means we get married, we have kids, we buy that house with the white picket fence, we get a good job and we move up in our career field, we grow our wealth so that we can retire and relax for the last 15 to 20 years of our life. That is, and has been for the last about almost 100 years now, the American dream for some time. And I want to be clear here that there's nothing inherently wrong with a single part of that. Not one singular part of that is wrong in any way, shape, or form. However, if we're not careful and we become so entranced by that and so dependent on our own selves to do those things, we stop leaning into the Heavenly Father for His provision in our life. And we begin, if we're not careful, we begin to desire those things more than the call of Jesus on our lives. We fit the call of Jesus into the American dream if we're not careful. We say, yes, okay, I know that Jesus has a call on my life, but first let me, let me get married, let me have kids, let me make sure I buy the house that I want, let me make sure I get the car that I want, I'm in my career field, and then let me find a church and, and, and plug in and I'll live out the call of Jesus on my life. The call of Jesus has to come first. And the call of Jesus is clear. Make disciples of all nations. Baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To allow, to follow Jesus means full and complete surrender and dependence on the Father. And it means that, especially for us, it doesn't mean that Jesus is going to be all that we have but we should be very careful to make sure that Jesus is all that we need. And just in case, church. And with that, with that word there, we, we see Jesus say this, deliver this truth to the scribe. And it doesn't implicitly say it here. It's implied that because of this truth, the scribe does not follow Jesus. And with that, another person approaches him. Verse 21. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Here we have another person, again, given this title of disciple and indicating this is likely someone who has followed Jesus for some time. We can't incorrectly read uh, that word disciple there and assume that this was one of the twelve. This was a follower of Jesus in the crowd. Uh, and he's probably, again, seen Jesus do amazing things. He's heard his teachings, and he's saying here, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to follow you full time. I want to go with you. He wants to be one of the disciples. But first, let me go and bury my father. And often, when we read this, we do so thinking that, okay, the father has passed. That his father has recently passed, and he is coming to Jesus saying, 
I'm in the middle of you know, funeral arrangements and burial arrangements. Let me go and take care of this. And then I'm going to, to come and follow you. This is not the case. This man is actually saying to Jesus, I want to follow you, but my father is still living. He's getting older. Let me go and live in his house. And I want to take care of him in his later years. And when he has died, I want to I'm bury him. He wanted to follow Jesus, but he wanted to do so at a time and in a way that was convenient for him. And I want to be clear here as well, as I was in talking about the American dream, what he's requesting here is not an absurd or crazy request. This is a common familial duty in the days of Jesus. That as a parent with age, their children would take care of them. There's a reason that Peter's sick mother-in-law is at Peter's house. That was customary in Jewish tradition. And so it was a familial duty that a son would take care of his aging parents. But in asking this, it allows Jesus to speak to one of the most fundamental truths of the gospel. Jesus comes first. Jesus comes first over everything else. Jesus is prioritized over our jobs, over our friendships, over our familial duties, over our dreams and, and desires. He is prioritized over our kids, over our marriages and our spouses. Jesus comes before everything else. And you say that to people, and people outside the church would say, you're telling, telling me that Jesus comes first for you in everything then your marriages are, are going to struggle. You're going you're gonna to struggle to be a good parent. You're going to struggle in your career. If Jesus is coming over all else, how do you find enough time for those other things? We, we would think that those other things would fall by the wayside, but yet when we prioritize Jesus over everything, we will begin to see something miraculous. We see growth in those other relationships, in those other areas of our life that never would have been possible without Jesus. Our marriage with our spouse takes on new meaning as we see throughout the scriptures how Christ loves and cares for his bride, the church. Our parenting takes new shape as we see the truth of how our Heavenly Father loves us and calls us to love our children. Our friendships grow in ways we have never before thought possible. We find new purpose and meaning in the day-to-day -day of our jobs. Colossians 3.23, no matter what you do, no matter what work you do, work at it as though working for the Lord Jesus and not for man. And the beauty of all of this church is, as I said this morning in our call to worship, when we do this, when we put Jesus first and prioritize him over all else, he doesn't just start making us a better version of ourselves. He doesn't even just start making us the best version of ourselves. He is making us our most Christ-like version of ourselves. And there's a fundamental and beautiful difference there. For so long, when I was in my early 20s, uh, my prayer to the Lord was, Lord, Make me a better man. That was what I prayed, that the Lord would make me better. And I realized as years went on, as I continued to study the scriptures, when I prayed those words, I was effectively kind of subconsciously saying to the Father, listen, there are things about me that are good, uh, and there are things about me I wish were better. And so make me a better man in some of those areas in which I fall short. And what I found as the years went on was I wasn't just someone that was in need of bettering. I was dead and needed to be brought back to life. And I was dead and he made me alive in Christ, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. To church, this morning, if you hear nothing else this morning, no matter where you are on your journey with Christ, whether you are like uh, the scribe and the disciple here, who they both come to Jesus with the best of intentions. I will follow you wherever you go. And first, Lord, let me go 
and do the duty I need to do to my father. Let me, let me help him in his later years. Let me serve him as he raised me. And then let me respect him and bury him. And then I'll come. It came with the best of intentions. Whether you are uh, like Peter and have been a disciple for some time, and whether you might be at the end of walking with him for some time, and you're getting to that place where you're ready to go and see him face to face, I think of the words of Paul when he says, oh, I want to depart and be with the Lord Jesus. I know that I need to be here. Uh, I know that I need to be here for the sake of the church, but my desire is to go and be with the Lord. No matter where we are on that journey with Jesus this morning, we have to be aware that Jesus is not just making us better. He is making us new. He is not just making you an improved version of who you are. I, I'm not, I don't want to be Bryce 2.0. He, I want him to take something that is dead and I want him to breathe new life into it. Patrick referenced this morning the book of Ezekiel chapter 37 that the dry bones uh, and Ezekiel stands and witnesses the flesh being placed on these bones and standing before him. But there was no life until the Lord said to Ezekiel, prophesy breath over these bones. And at that moment, the breath of the Lord enters into the dry bones, and then there was life. And that is what Jesus is bringing. That is what we're seeing filming up. In Ezekiel 36, we see the Lord tell Ezekiel that he wants to replace our hearts of stone with a new heart of flesh, a new heart part of flesh, a new spirit within us. And that is what it means when Paul says we were dead and now we are made alive in the Lord Jesus. And so church this morning, I want us to center our hearts on that truth as we prepare for a closing worship here. He's not making us better. He's not taking something that is uh, that is in need of improvement and making improvements. He is taking something dead and making us new. And in order for that to happen, there has to be complete and total surrender. That it's no longer about my desires and wants. It's about what he has for me. And it's no longer about uh, taking care of our earthly duties. And once I'm in a good place, then I'll follow Jesus. So many people are going through life, and whether they would say this out loud or not, so many people are going through life with this mindset of, I'm going to live kind of how I want to live for about the first half of my life. And then as I get later in life, as I start to slow down, then I'll plug into a church. And then I'll walk, you know, I'll walk with God. I'll walk in what the Lord has for me. It's a beautiful thing, but I'll do that later. Jesus is calling us now. Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. He wants every last bit of us because he loves us, church, as who he is. Would you pray with me to prepare for worship? Jesus, I thank you this morning that you are not just uh, taking something that has a couple of flaws and working those flaws out and making it better. Lord, you are taking something dead and breathing new life into it. Jesus, would you breathe new life into it? Lord, would you fill us up right now in the Spirit of God. Lord, we want to be filled to overflowing so that as we leave this place, Jesus, the love would just pour out of us. That we would, just by our very daily actions, by the way that we, by the way that we work, by the way that we parent, by the way that we love our spouses, just in the simple day-to-day -day of life, we would point people back to you. That is what we want, Jesus. Let us live lives that shout the love of Jesus with our words and with our actions. Lord, we want to go deeper. Stir in us that desire for more of you, God, for more of your word, for more of your spirit, for more of you, so that we can see the unsearchable riches and depth of Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. Be with us this morning as we close and worship and as we leave this place. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.
pray that with me this morning. Jesus, we pray to leave this place. Lord, we would be that fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus. And as we go throughout our days, as we go throughout our weeks, as we are around the people in our day-to-day -day lives, Lord, we are the aroma of, of Christ to God among those who are being saved, among those who are perishing. Lord, we know that we have the great commission on our hearts to save as many people as we can to bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to do so with our words, with our actions, with our lives. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that that fear doesn't 